Welcome, low ego action heroes. This is Debbie Levitt from DeltaCX.com. We're a full service CX and UX consultancy. Welcome to Friday, April 1st, 2022. It's the Practicing Critical Thinking stream. There are no April Fool's jokes here today. I don't do that. Um, but I do want to thank the people who donate to the channel financially through YouTube, uh, through the Join Membership Program. And again, that's totally optional, but always appreciated. I ate lots of chocolate chips today, and I'm grateful to all of you who fund my chocolate chip habit. Thanks especially to our mid and senior level low ego action heroes. So uh, every Friday we do practicing critical thinking, where we take a look at some stuff that's floating out there on the interwebs, and we break it down and ask questions and think critically about it. If you'd like to send something in to appear on this stream, just follow the links, Delta CX dot com slash links and you'll find something there that says I want to send something in for the critical thinking stream. So hope everybody's doing well and has some good weekend plans. I am going to open up my browser and get straight to the pile of wackiness that people have sent in. Let's take a look. Uh, okay, there you go. So there's me and the chat room and the tip jar and the giant browser and it's a private browser as usual. So Someone sent me this um, university thing. And the weird thing about the page is I can't tell what this is. I don't know if this is a certificate or a bachelor's degree or a master's degree. The page literally doesn't say, but it does say courses. Um, so I probably have to go to some other page to figure out what this is. And they asked, is this good? Now, remember, it's really hard for me to say if any particular courses are good or not, if I haven't taken them. Um, typically I am looking at the, uh, courses. I'm looking at who the professors are. A good course taught by the wrong professor or instructor can be a bad course. So it, it's really hard for me to judge these things when I am not familiar with them. Um, I am typically looking for, do they seem to be teaching real CX or UX or some sort of fake CX or UX? Hi, Miguel. Um, so I'm looking for design thinking, lean UX, democratization, uh, design sprints. Now I don't see that here. So I think that means this has some sort of shot, but there's a bunch of things here that made me give a little bit of a you know, huh? So I think you have to think about what kind of work you want to go into in CX or UX. This looks like this is going to set you up for um, information architecture, interaction design, but also a lot of visual design. So here I saw digital graphic design, concepts of graphic design. Um, so there seem to be two courses, at least on visual design, advanced web authoring. I was a little bit surprised at it's like visual design, usability, audio, video, site management, and accessibility. It sounded like you were going to run web servers that, that seemed a little outdated. I, I tend to think of those as engineering jobs. So I wasn't too sure what that was. Digital rhetoric seems to be about ethics. So, you know, that sounds good. So I would have to say without knowing more about this particular program, I think it seems interesting. I don't think it's something that I would take. Um, but I think it seems interesting. I would definitely go for that information architecture elective. You can't learn enough about information architecture. Um, I assume these are out of order and in some sort of weird fake alphabetical order. Um, but you know, some of these things had weird names where they didn't seem to make sense until you read the, uh, description, like using problem solving processes. Okay. That, that sounds good. It, that sounds good to learn. So I would say in general, these things sound good to learn. Um, I was just a, a little bit, what at first, uh, at the way that they, um, explained them like this, there's an entire course on career options. Is that a is that a full course? Is there a test on that? Um, philosophy of technology. So I think this seems interesting. Uh, I'm again, I'm not sure I would take it and it really depends in many ways on who's teaching it. Let's see if we go back one, what this is. It's a bachelor's. So, um, that's not bad. Now, of course, we know you don't have to have a, a bachelor's to, uh, to get a good job. It would be great to kind of, um, look up these people and see what they're doing now. 
you know, and also how long after they got their, um, well, it looks like there's a bunch of people named Ashton Keys, so we'll have to see if we can figure this out. Um, how long after they got their degree did they end up getting their first job? So it looks like... Looks like they finished this, but, um, and they were the 2018 student of the year. So it looks like they got a job fairly quickly in augmented reality. Then they've done a lot of entrepreneur stuff. So yeah, sounds like that's what they're interested in. So I would say you, you, if you're looking at a program, find some of the people who graduated, see how long it took them to get a job, see if they felt like their degree made them ready for the job, do the research and, and figure it out. Rodana says, hi, Debbie, I may be late to the party, but I have a course I'd like you to overlook in relation to UX. So this is not necessarily the look at courses um, stream. We've done three of those already. So um, you can always go back in time, especially because I have a slide that I show where I talk about uh, what should you look for when you're assessing a course, but mostly it's going to be um, who's teaching it and what are you learning with a couple of other things. But this is the critical thinking stream. So let's take a look at the other things on the list. Rodana, if you want to um, paste your URL in, I hope um, we'll be able to see it in LinkedIn and we can take a look at it um, at the end if we have time. Uh, someone sent me Indy Young's courses. Now, um, I'm kind of hot and cold on Indy Young and I haven't taken any of her courses. So I cannot, again, personally speak to any of these courses. I don't know if they're good or bad. I don't know if they're worth what they cost or not worth what they cost. Um, so I can say that I don't feel like I've seen a lot of courses that cover these topics. Obviously, mental model diagrams tends to be a bit of her thing. Um, even though I kind of don't love her approach to mental model diagrams. But again, if you find that it's useful, then it's worth it. You know, ultimately these are worth it if it's up to you. Um, this looks like a sarcophagus or some sort of tomb. So I'm not sure why this is the picture. Um, this is going to be next held next year. So that seems a little bit weird. Um, this is being held next week. Listening deeply, concepts and summaries, cultivating patterns, framing your study, and um, take the course live or get recordings. Um, okay, thanks, Rodana. We'll take a look at the end. Um, so again, again, I can try to judge courses, but it's really hard because I don't know what your learning goals are. I don't see anything here that immediately turns me off. We know she's not selling design thinking, design sprints, lean UX and democratization. And we know that she's fairly reputable in the world of UX. Um, but again, I haven't taken the courses and so I can't say, uh, specifically, um, I would say ask her for people who um, have taken them, or I found a way this morning on LinkedIn. I actually searched for a course on LinkedIn and I found all the people who had added it to their education. And then I wrote to them and said, did you like this? And so now nobody's written me back yet, but, um, that's something you can do. You could copy and paste some of these in, see if people added the the course or the certificate or something to their education and say, hey, did you like this? Did it help your work? Was it worth what it cost? So I think that's a great way with anything you can't go wrong, including Rodana's SMU link that uh, we're seeing here from, uh, from LinkedIn in the chat room above my head. Find the people who've done these things and see if they got the job felt prepared for the job, were in over their head, etc. So there you go. Staying on the Indie Young uh, topic, we've got an Indie Young Medium article from 2019 that appears to be from her 2017 uh, newsletter. Um, yes, so Rodana says, I did that. And Kelsey says, that's a good idea. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so 
Uh, this one's called Instead of Average, and it seems to be about how mathematically we can do mean, median, and mode, but they all give us different pieces of information, and we should be aware of these different pieces of information when we are assessing uh, figures and considering um, whatever we're considering. So uh, we know that uh, mean is the average. We know, uh, some of you don't know median and mode. So median is if we lined up all the numbers, like, so she gives an example here. How many children are in your family? Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 or more. And, you know, a number of people, a uh, hundred people answered this survey. And here's how the, the answers uh, distribute, distribute. So the idea here would be if we lined up all the 19 zeros, 28 ones, 16 twos, 15 threes, etc. what number would end up in the middle of that? That's your median. So some people like that, that figure, some people don't use it. I feel like it doesn't always tell me that much. So I'm not a big fan of median. I, I tend to be a little bit more on mean or average, but she talks about mode. Mode is an interesting number that she says you shouldn't forget. And mode is the value that occurs the most frequently. So the idea here is that even though our average is 2.15, and I don't know what our me, uh, median would be because I didn't put these into Excel, but she reminds you the mode is the number we see the most, which is one. So even though the average is 2.15, the most people said one. What are you going to do about that? You know, and then she says, and don't forget the range. Now, I think the range is important because this is when we talk, especially in design, about things that scale. So sometimes people design things. Hey, Steph, sometimes people design things and they look great for two or three things. You know, they do a big grid. The grid looks great if there's two or three things. And I say, okay, how does this look if there's a hundred things? And then people go, oh, oh yeah, this might not look right. So I think, I think that's her point, but I'm not sure that the point is made that strongly in the article, but I think there's a hint of, of a point here. Um, and so I think it's a good point, but I, I think I wish the article were a little longer and made this point a little bit uh, more strongly. So there you go. Um, I got sent, of course, the usual design thinking Twitter comic. Oh, Boy, I can't see it without logging in. And this is a light box and I can't click away from this. So let's try refreshing. There's no way to click out of that. Here you go. Stand up before starting work, terrible. Meeting instead of getting work done, true. Another meeting instead of getting work done, yes. Retro to discuss work we didn't get done, sure. Team catch up instead of eating lunch, yep. Planning to discuss work we're not gonna get done, sure. Emergency meeting to discuss urgent work that won't be worked on, sure. FFS, which is a swear word. One-to-one -to, -one to discuss how to get more work done. Looks like I'm not watching telly. And um, the boss says, you really shouldn't have to be working evenings and weekends to get your work done. Ooh, do I have a friend I'm going to send this to when the stream is over? So, yeah, agree. As always, the design thinking uh, comic is uh, always a good one. All right, this was a tweet from Doug Collins, who I know of but don't follow. And um, this is some sort of meme that says... I get one designer for every six developers and you get products that are researched, tested, and designed before they get to dev. And Doug says, I would prefer one designer for every four developers. And I say, hold my beer because I am recommending five UX practitioners for every development team. So if you've seen my episode 116, that's what I'm recommending. Sure, it seems like a little bit of a far off dream, but I say hold on to that far off dream because I think it's going to be possible. We have one UX person on a team, eventually you might have two. I tell companies keep hiring until you don't have a bottleneck. I would like to see two designers and three researchers for every product team, whether that's product manager or owner or development team. So sure, Doug, I, I can't live with six to one. I think that's not enough UX people. And I wish we would stop acting like that's some sort of 
pinnacle or standard. It's a stepping stone to getting UX in more, to have one fully allocated resource to a team, but we've got to go beyond that because that person is overworked and hates their job. So we're not doing it right. All right. This was uxtools.co, and it appears to be a blog article, and I don't see a date on it. Um, looks fairly recent since they are quoting something from a few months ago, so I assume this is fairly recent, but it doesn't go away, pop up doesn't have a date. And it says quicker UX research synthesis. Now, sometimes you need to try to analyze and synthesize your research more quickly. Sometimes you have the luxury of extra time to rewatch all of your videos and go through things a little bit more slowly. So this person is trying to give you some tips uh, for if you need to try to analyze and synthesize more quickly. In short, and I appreciate they gave us the list up front, synthesize along the way, do the work up front, find a synth synthesis buddy, know when to use workshops, use tools to be more efficient, and wrapping up. So let's take a look here. Synthesize along the way. Uh, they're saying synthesize for five to 10 minutes immediately following each research session. Um, I stopped the session a few minutes early and riff with product manager a few minutes. So uh, that's sometimes called a debrief where sometimes people will end the session on time or I, I wouldn't end it early, I'll end it on time and I'll leave time for it after and uh, check with any note takers or observers on anything that they uh, notice that they want to talk about and we can note these down. Um, I don't really think of this as synthesis just yet. I would probably still think of this as notes and analysis and the synthesis will come later, but either way, um, sure, you can certainly do this type of technique whether or not you are short on time. Doing the work up front threw me a little bit because I am not too sure how much synthesis you can do before you've held the research sessions. So they're saying set goals, establish a hypothesis, narrow your research scope. We're supposed to be planning our research Anyway, so I'm not too sure if this is telling us something new. We should have planned our research before we did it, and I don't think that necessarily helps us synthesize faster. We're supposed to have planned our research anyway, so this one's not really clicking for me. Find a synthesis buddy. Finding teammates might not be your first thought for research synthesis. Um, other people can play an important role. Um, so I do think that involving other people it's to, who have observed the research, either live or watching the videos, and getting their notes or impressions can be a good thing. Um, however, I always warn people that the more you bring in people from outside of UX into some of these things, the more they might accidentally feel like, oh, I, I can do this too. This looks easy. Hey, Darren, good to see you. So, uh, Darren, you missed this. Somebody wanted us to comment on the MSU Experience Architecture Bachelors. I sent you a message and I don't think I saw a reply. Do you have an opinion on that? Uh, okay, so we'll wait to see what Darren says and we'll go back to this. So yeah, definitely you can make uh, analysis and synthesis uh, hopefully go faster with somebody else. I always recommend another researcher, a junior researcher, a research apprentice, um, because uh, technically we've probably already gotten the notes if we follow the other uh, example, we've gotten the notes and ideas and, and observ observations from product managers or engineers or people who observed. And, um, so I would say, yeah, see if you can get some extra help. Darren says it's a great program. They're doing some fantastic things. Okay, cool. So that adds to what I said earlier, where I said, it seems interesting. Um, but, uh, you know, you got to check it out for yourself. Um, okay. And this guy again with his five minute session after a call, I bet these never really last five minutes. Everybody knows you say to someone, Hey, let's just talk for five minutes. You know, it's going to be 20. 
know when to use workshops. Many people know I am against workshops. So, uh, let's take a look. Uh, a fan of workshops when done correctly, they can be an efficient use of time, workshop activities, workshop for synthesis. And again, I always differentiate between a workshop and a meeting. If this is really just a meeting for you and maybe a UX coworker to go through an affinity board and try to find some themes, I don't see that as a workshop. I see that as a meeting. Um, so be careful of when you use workshops and especially when you call things workshops, because again, you, you might give people the impression that UX does its work by workshops and all you have to do is get five people together in a room and wow, we've, we've analyzed all of our UX data and it was that easy. So be careful of that. This is one of those things that seems like you're going to be fast and efficient and democratize. And then it could bite you in the butt later if you give the impression that UX is something really easy that five people can do in a room for an hour. Darren says, one of the few UX undergrad programs in the country too. I interact with programs and students regularly. Okay. So that's a super plus from Darren. Use tools to be more efficient. Zoom, Rev, Descript, Dovetail, User Zoom Go, Notion, Airtable, obviously all of these not sponsored. Um, so yeah, certainly tools can help you move faster. Uh, at uh, Delta CX, we've been using Dovetail, uh, which we like a lot. Uh, hashtag not sponsored. I pay them and they don't pay me. So um, yeah, certainly using tools. We found that, that uh, tagging transcripts and making some notes in Dovetail can help, help us go faster. Darren says, if anyone's interested, I interviewed one of the founders and directors of that program about a year ago on my podcast, Dr. Casey. Okay. So I guess Google Darren Hood podcast, Dr. Casey, and see if you can find it. Um, so I think some of these tips are helpful, but I think they do, um, possibly skate on the line of what's democratization and what's still UX research territory. So just remember to be careful there, uh, because I don't recommend going into democratization territory. All right. Next, y'all sent me um, a recent video from, I think her name is uh, I Iona. Iona. I, I have to admit, I don't really watch her videos, which tells you, you can tell because I'm not sure how she pronounces her name. You'd think if I watched her videos, I would know how she pronounces her name. And this one is how to self-study UX research and design. And of course, as soon as we talk about self-study, you know, a, a red flag goes off for me because I think we have to remember that while there's positives to self-study and books and courses and other things that you can do, you have to remember that without a mentor or a coach guiding you and looking in on your work, you don't even know what you don't even know. And I see a lot of videos coming out now about self-study and, and, and that kind of thing. And I say, Okay, but how do you know if you're studying the right things? How do you know if you're reading the right book or taking the right course or right, watching the right video? How do you know if you're applying the knowledge correctly once you start stuff? And that's where I think things fall apart. And I remind people, uh, oh, Darren says it's his episode 41. And Darren says non-experts need to stop pre presenting themselves as experts. She wants to be a celebrity. Um, yeah. And again, there's, uh, if you want to be a celebrity, cool. Um, you know, you be you. Um, but again, when I take a look at the chaptering in the video, uh, three tips for self-learning UX, which I wrote down and I'm going to share with you in a moment, but I didn't bother, uh, watching the rest of the video cause I could tell from the chaptering. So I'm grateful to her for including chaptering. I don't always make the time to do that. In fact, I rarely make the time to do that, but then again, I don't make my money from YouTube. So, you know, maybe if I did, I would spend more time on it, but, um, Demo, how to conduct a pro prototype testing with UX Tweak. Now her video is sponsored by UX Tweak. I did some videos where I talked about unmoderated studies with UX Tweak and we were not sponsored by UX Tweak. So, you know, just look out there. She, this video is sponsored. You know, whether, I don't know whether or not she uses it at her day job. Um, my self-learning materials recommendations. I didn't watch it. Online classes, what to look for, UX book recommendations, YouTube channel recommendations. I don't know who she recommends. She's got a whole list here. Um, I could always watch her YouTube channel recommendations, which is only 40 seconds long. 
That's not a lot. But let's first talk about her three tips, and then I guess I will listen to her 40 seconds of YouTube channel recommendations and watch myself not be mentioned. Um, so her self-learning tip number one was consider lots of sources. Consider that there are books and videos and courses and groups and, and whatever. Okay, seems obvious. Can't disagree. Um, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, her second tip, as I have frozen on the screen, was evaluate how much knowledge you already have. For me, this is where the tips fall apart. Because if you are just learning something, you don't know how much knowledge you already have, and you're likely to self-assess incorrectly. Not because you're a jerk or a bad person or I don't like you, but because it's really common for somebody who doesn't even know what they don't even know to not self-assess correctly on how much knowledge they have about a topic. How much knowledge do I have about music of the Renaissance? I took one course in college. I have that much knowledge. Tiny. Put it in a thimble. And I'm reminded of how little knowledge I have of music of the Renaissance, even after taking an entire college course on it, when I watch one of my favorite YouTubers, Early Music Sources, a guy who specializes in music of the Renaissance and, and mostly just before the Renaissance. Um, Darren says, yeah, she talks about self-learning and the second segment jumps straight to prototyping huge red flag. LinkedIn person whose name isn't coming up, sorry, says, so true. I've taught myself a few things, but I think you can gain useful insight from seeking out professional help so you don't risk learning wrong principles. Yeah, having to relearn stuff is funky. And so be careful of you don't even know what you don't even know. And that's why I'm always recommending mentors and coaches with years of experience who can take a look at what you're doing and say, yes, no, et cetera. So be careful of that. And then her, her, her tip number three was create a project, which we've talked about on this channel before. And you know that my advice there as well as whether you're doing a real or fake project, get a mentor or coach. How many times do I have to say it? What, what was it? Quante volte, Pier Mario? Quante volte devo dirti. Anyway, it's an inside joke over here at the house about uh, an Italian sentence that had how many times do I have to tell you? Um, and um, again, you can create a project. I'm going to go research people and fly swatters. How do they use fly swatters and how many do they need? And is there a better way to swat a fly? Okay, but what if you plan your research badly? Who's going to check that? How are you going to know? Are you going to level up? How are you going to level up if nobody's looking at your research plan and going, no, 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 this isn't the right way to go, or maybe something more gentle than that? Darren says, not from ADP list. Yeah, I definitely run more cold than hot on ADP list. I'm not hot at all, in fact. Um, hey, Oz, how you doing? Good morning to you. Um, we are just uh, talking about this woman's video. This is the old reaction stream renamed the critical thinking stream. So welcome to the Friday stream. We are ripping this woman's video uh, apart and applying our critical thinking. Um, so that means if I'm going to listen to her talk about YouTubers, she recommends, I'm going to need to put on my headset. You're not going to hear it because I don't want to get a copy strike, uh, against me for playing her video, uh, with the audio. So hold on a moment. Let's see. YouTube channel recommendations. YouTube videos, long form videos with visual training are the best supplemental material to learn research and design. She says, not because I'm a YouTuber. I want to list out my recommended research and design channels on YouTube here. So here's who she recommends. Herself, fantastic. NNG, okay. Kevin Liang, who we've, run more cold than hot on tiffster never heard of her and she has 432 subscribers so this seems extremely new i wonder if it's her buddy the craft with sarah tajima haven't heard of her femka design you have all sent me before so i've heard of her but i don't watch her chun buns 
with 120,000 subscribers and Yobi321. All people, people I've never heard of for the most part. And these are the people she's recommending. Uh, her herself. Yeah. Ah, oh, Jaren. It's everybody. It's the Mutual Love Society. Um, so she's got, let's see. I'm curating playlists for people with different needs on my channel. So she wants you to go look at her playlists. Okay. Those are her YouTube channel recommendations. They're, they're not mine. Um, and it looks like even YouTube doesn't recommend those people. If you're watching this woman's video, they mostly recommend her and not these other people. So, okay. So, you know, we've bumped into this person before. We watched another video of hers that was mostly likable. This one, I I'm not feeling it. Uh, I don't think that um, this is a video I can uh, recommend. And I'm a little bit concerned about some of the advice. It's your really typical um, advice. Um, so let's see, LinkedIn user says, I've heard of Chun Bun. Some of them self-learned and pivoted into UX. I know you need a mentor, but where do you find one if you don't have a network? If you're self-learning, it often means you don't have a budget to access the top courses. I try to listen to people like you to start. Well, thank you. Um, and it's bias, everyone's journey is different, of course. But I think that there's something tough here. You know, people keep telling me, I don't have a budget to learn UX. I don't have a budget to learn UX. And I keep thinking, I think you've got to come up with one. Because sometimes I tell people, hey, buy this book. And they go, oh, I don't want to buy that book. That book was $40. And I go, hey, you need a budget to learn anything. Any career you want to get into, you're going to have to learn something and it's going to cost you money. If you wanted to get into being a yoga instructor, you're going to get certified. That's going to cost you money. If you want to become an acupuncturist, You've got to be go to doctor of Chinese medicine. It's going to cost you money. Guess what? Going into careers costs money. And I'm surprised when people say, hey, I, I don't have money to learn this. And I go, uh, I, then I have no advice for you. If you have no money to learn something, I don't know what to tell you. I'm putting up as much out there for free as I can, but I still believe very strongly in you needing that mentor or coach who's going to look at your work and help you go in the right direction. That's supposed to be a boot camp or, or school instructor, yet they don't look at people's work. They let you do a project. They let you do it for weeks or months. And at the end they go, yeah, looks like a thing you did fine. That's not okay. So I don't know what to tell people who tell me they don't have a budget for, for any of this. How did you get into the career you have now? How did you learn anything? Have you ever taken a piano lesson? I'm sorry, I'm not trying to sound angry or bitchy, but I'm just thinking, how do you get into a career and expect to get everything for free? It, it's not gonna happen. Or you're gonna sacrifice what you're learning or the quality of your learning or the speed of your learning because you went for the freest or cheapest things you could find. Um, Linda says, becoming a yoga instructor is ridiculously expensive. And hello, hello. Noor says, yes, but not having access for money should not limit us to seek knowledge. Of course, nobody's blocking you from seeking knowledge. There's a difference between seeking knowledge and I expect to have a career ASAP in this thing. If I want to seek knowledge about something, sure, I can go out there and I can watch YouTube videos and read books and that's inexpensive or maybe I find these things for free. But if it's something you expect to have a career in and if that career involves training, remember, if you limit yourself to the free training, look, a lot of people will limit themselves to the training they can find for free. And then they show up to my streams and they go, but how do I stand out? How do I get my resume to stand out? How do I get my portfolio to stand out? How do I get my work to stand out? Well, unfortunately, you could be accidentally limiting yourself because you said, I'm only going to do 
the free things because I don't have a budget to learn UX. But then you and 300,000 other people did that and now you don't stand out. And so I'm not saying it takes money to work in UX. Certainly there are people who learn from free things, find a free mentor and end up in UX. Sure, it happens, but is it the majority of people? If it were the majority of people, then we would see a lot more people in UX and much fewer people, especially juniors saying, I can't find a job. So it tells me something here is broken and actually a lot of things here are broken. But I think that if you really want to pursue a career in a field that requires training, you're going to have to budget for training at some point. That, that's just a personal belief I have. Yes, I believe training should be yet less expensive than it is so that it is more available to more people, but I don't expect the best, highest quality training out there to be free. Today, I was looking at courses for, for people who want to get into UX and, or learn UX. Nearly every course I saw was roughly $3,000. Every, these were like video courses. A couple of them were live courses, $3,000. Now, am I saying that's high, low, good, bad? That's up to you. For some people, that's a fair number. And for some people, that's a number they're never going to have. And you're both right. But I think that we have to imagine that, that teaching has value. Teachers should be paid. We shouldn't expect our best teachers to teach for free. And so stuff is going to cost money and I don't know what to tell you. I'm doing everything I can for free. Um, LinkedIn user says, try to see if there's a reputable college that has a course offering a college course in UX. It's a give and take, giving up something to attain a greater goal, but it's a sacrifice. Uh, and Noor says, I'm not saying I don't agree. Steph says, I was surprised the library of my city had some of the big UX and IA books, I guess, and AI books. So. A library card could be a solution. They're quite cheap. Sure, that's one way to get books off for free. Kelsey says, I feel that free things are usually limiting because there's only so much time and energy a person can put in for free. Steph says, also, some authors are nice enough to grant you access to their book if you're a student and you ask nicely. Kelsey says, agree with the library. I borrowed about 80% of my UX books from the local library. So obviously, we could do an entire future show on... How, much, how far can you really get in UX for free? And of course, some people will get all the way, but will most, will you? I, I don't know. And do you want to play those odds? That's the question. Or are you going to be that person who I see on LinkedIn who is in year two of hoping to get a UX job, and unfortunately, you, you don't seem job ready because your learning stopped here. Abby says there's also currency difference, time zone issues, books are good to start learning. Absolutely, you're right about everything you just said. Time zones, currency, all of these are problems. A lot of people, and also a lot of people are pricing courses on the assumption that your job is paying for it. They imagine you have a job that is giving you some sort of um, professional development budget so they can charge $500, $2,000, $3,000 for conferences and courses because your job will pay for that. And they don't realize your job won't pay for that. Um, ah, Linda says there's a free version of How to Make Sense of Any Mess on Abby Covert's website. Yeah, great book. Definitely read that. Um, so let's see, and what else can I tell you? So for example, my new workshop, which is next week, um, you can find it on the deltacx.com website under training and then transforming toward customer centricity. And I'll do it again in the future. So if you're watching this in the future, just check. Um, for the first version, I am pricing it at $97 if your company can pay for it or if that number is not scary for you and $27 if you are paying for it yourself or the number 97 is scary to you. And so far, most people have paid 27. And we offered a couple of free ones in our Slack channel and nobody took them. So I think I'm in the right spot now. What I'll probably do in the future is raise the higher price on the assumption that this is what people's jobs are reimbursing. And so a job doesn't really blink at a $200 course versus a $100 course, but I'll keep it low for the people who are paying out of their pocket. And I'm hoping that given the honor system, people will choose uh, uh, the best one. 
Uh, let's see. Linda says, I think Rosenfeld Media just had a flash sale. And don't forget bundles of books that are discounted. LinkedIn user says, I met with an executive director at my organization who I met on LinkedIn and asked to speak with him. And through talking, he recommended that if I wanted to show I'm serious, I should pursue some type of certificate in UX. It will set those that are serious and those that just get by apart. I would disagree there. I mean, if that's the place where you want to work and that's the standard that person goes by, then okay. But I think it's, it's, uh, a lot of certificates are not necessarily worth the time or the money. So I would say, be careful, keep that critical thinking hat on. Um, Kate says a lot of libraries have O'Reilly books. Chi Huat says in Singapore, library membership is free and it gives you access to Udemy business courses, eBooks, music, DVDs, and books. Cool. So libraries, everybody, great free way to get stuff. All right, we've got two more things to talk about today before we try to roll back and see Rodana's thing. This was, should cancel be a button or a link? And I skimmed this today, and this person says, navigation is a link, action is a button. Action is a manipulation of data the user is managing through the interface of the web app. Navigation is a state change of the interface the user is navigating through. So here they sh he shows an underlined link because it's a back button, but then he shows an underlined link for edit, which I would see as an action and not a navigation. What? Edit's not a navigation. So, but then he's saying, oh, but, but this is navigation because it navigates you to this screen. Well, so does create. Create technically navigates you to a screen or page where you do a thing. So by his own definition, I don't think this really makes sense. I think he's muddied his own definition by trying to claim that some of these things that are really actions are navigations. So I'm not feeling this. Um, and then he showed this like, oh, add fruit being underlined. No, 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 this is all wrong. It should be add fruit as a button. But then he has all of these underlined. They're not navigation. To me, they're actions. So I don't say that, I, I don't think I would buy his definition that actions are buttons, navigations are underlined, and this is an action and this is a button. I feel like he's made it difficult and unclear and inconsistent. Um, so like here's his idea that cancel is... Should cancel be uh, underlined or a button? And I guess we'll never know. Even though that was the name of his article. He's saying an X needs the word close next to it. No, we all know this paradigm. Cancel. I don't see why cancel could, couldn't be a secondary button. He's saying, no, cancel cannot be a secondary button. It requires a link because they're doing the same thing as the closing side panel. And because he made, he didn't make this a button, he wouldn't make this a button. Yeah, I'm not feeling it. I'm not buying it. And uh, I don't think it totally makes sense. I think, you know, in general, the underlined link in this paradigm is seen as a tertiary link. If you only have a or a tertiary action or technically button, if you, if this would be primary. So hypothetically, this would be primary and secondary, which means it could be correct to make this a secondary button. If this, if these are the only two, I guess you could do primary and tertiary if you really want to try to deprioritize it visually, but, uh, I'm not buying his, uh, his other, um, ways of explaining this doesn't work for me. Oz says, 
One thing that drove me crazy, people at a job asking me to help them in Excel for free, tutor them on their work stuff, the stuff they get paid for. Some would even bitch me out for saying no. Yeah, that's a really great point, Oz. Like I said before, there are people who have spent a lot of time being um, very advanced in their craft and being great teachers, like Oz is. If you want to learn Excel, you want to learn it from Oz, and his YouTube channel is Excel on Fire, hashtag not sponsored. And Oz deserves to be paid if you or your company are bringing him in for training. You, you, you can't just be like, hey, come over to my desk and help me with this for free. You know, that's, that's not the right question. I think the right question is, I need some help with Excel. What do you charge for a half hour of your time? Now, at that point, Oz can say, gee, a half hour, your company's already paying me. I'll, I'll help your team out a little bit extra. That's up to him. Or he can say, thank you for asking. I get paid a squillion dollars an hour and let's arrange some training time. So I think when you take for granted that someone is going to do or give you something for free, it can seem like you don't appreciate that person and, and what they uh, have the power and opportunity to teach you. Steph says, this is how you end up with empty A links instead of HTML buttons for cancel buttons, and that sucks for accessibility, not a good idea. Okay, so Steph says, this isn't accessible, so wah, wah. Oh, good news, everybody. He's an internet pioneer. I want to make sure everybody caught that. He's an internet pioneer. Him, he invented Netscape, I bet. All right, let's move on. So someone sent me this and they said, um, this is a website and what do you think of it? So again, I don't have a lot of knowledge of what's going on here. It looks like people might be able to uh, apply for a business loan. And um, now usually we review websites on Mondays, but I figured I would throw this in here and remind everybody if you want a website to be reviewed, send it in for think out loud rather than reaction uh, or, or critical thinking stream. So first of all, this is your typical terms and conditions. Most people won't look at this other than to maybe figure out what is the, the interest rate they might be charged on the loan. I have read and agree. Sounds to me like we're going to move into an application. Kelsey's enjoying internet pioneer. Steph says, well, it could be accessible. You could style it like a link, but no devil do that. They'll code it as a link if it looks like a link. Loan calculator. Ooh. Okay. So this loan calculator does not look very friendly. This doesn't really look like a standard calculator. This looks like a form. This looks like I have to fill out a form rather than a, uh, having an easy calculator. So this is something that should be easy that it, I think we've made look visually, uh, more complicated than it needs to be. Um, oh, Linda is good. Linda says, internet pioneer, hope he doesn't get dysentery or lose a wagon wheel. Very good reference. Um, I am not a gamer, but even I know that reference. So I would say that this is not the right paradigm for a financial calculator. It does look like we are trying to fill out a form. So how much do I want to repay per month? I don't know. I'm making up money. Um, what interest rate? Uh, I don't get it. Do I get to make up my own interest rate? Zero. You know, why isn't the interest rate here put in for me? Think about Larry Marine's knowledge design, but I see over here, there's a 0.29% option. So I assume that that's a choice. 12 months. I don't know why these aren't maybe drop lists. If you have fixed choices, otherwise I'm just going to make up my own thing and then calculate. This is my maximum loan amount. So yeah, I think this isn't a great interface for the loan calculator. Noor says, I think he's an internet pioneer. He said he's an internet pioneer because he makes him sound cool. Yeah. I, I think that in, unless you are an internet pioneer, you shouldn't say you're an internet pioneer, but that's just me. Um, so ultimately I think that, um, this is, Okay, so this is not a good page either because this one said eligibility and documents and then it took me to another web page and then this one said I've read and agree, but you would think that eligibility and documents would be 
here because I'm saying that I agree to it. So yeah, I think that we haven't really thought out the user flow here. And I think there are some interaction design uh, issues where this hasn't been made as simple um, as it could be made. And I'm also worried, uh, why isn't the calculator just on the page? Why is the calculator a pop-up? That's uh, not going to be great. Um, thanks for sending that in. Um, we've got a few minutes left. Let's take a look at what Rodana sent in. If you're still here, I apologize if you couldn't wait an hour for me to take a look at what you sent in. Um, this is SMU, which I always forget what school this is. Um, oh, Southern Methodist in Dallas. Okay. So this one pops up a lot because I've spoken a few times in Dallas and I've met some of these people. So I've met, um, uh, Alyssa and Jay and Brian and Brandon. Brian brought me in to speak at a uh, big D conference in, uh, 2019. I was sitting with, uh, Alyssa or was it Alisa? I forgot now it was 2019. I sat with, uh, that person when, um, when Spool was giving his super evil talk and, and, uh, Ms. Miller watched me freak out over it. Um, hey, Rodana. Um, so I have seen people go through this program and not be ready for uh, prime time. That being said, some of these instructors are good at UX and do have good UX backgrounds. So hopefully they have improved um, this since the last time I, I looked at it, which was probably 2019 when I was more involved with, uh, the community of Dallas. Let's take a look at the program details. Now, again, we're look, we already saw that there were some decent instructors there, though I didn't know all of them. And we're looking for things that look like we're staying away from design thinking, design sprints, lean UX, and democratization. We look like we're really going to learn human computer interaction. So, uh, your early bird rate is about $3,700 and it's going to take you six months. Let's take a look at what your, uh, this is program details. I want to know what I'm going to learn. I guess I have to press courses. Introduction to user experience, user research and user centered analysis, user experience design and process strategy usability testing, electives are accessibility. Again, I don't like to see that as an elective. If that is an elective, please, please take it. It should not be an elective. Um, sadly, design thinking is an elective. So I give you a thumbs up on that, but hopefully they're not mentioning design thinking if you don't take that course. Hopefully if you're doing user experience, they're not saying design thinking. Let's see. Um, UX, content strategy, IA, design principles, front end dev, I don't believe you need, product design, UX as part of your marketing strategy, how to sell it to the C-suite, service design, trends, accessibility, that hurts. Accessibility is not a trend, it's not optional, so uh, I'm not loving this. Uh, Bobby says, oh my goodness, I am biting my tongue over here. Bobby, why are you biting your tongue? Did you go through this program? We don't bite our tongues here at Delta CX. We say it out loud. Come on. Um, so come on, Bobby, let's hear it. Um, user research and center, user experience, design and process strategy. Let's make sure we're not throwing design thinking in here. Yep, here it is. Design thinking, boo, hiss, done with that not okay. So I think that's unfortunate since I do believe that design thinking in nearly all of its forms is going to be a rushed boiled down version of UX that is speed over quality. So, um, I think, you know, again, when I was involved more in the Dallas community in 2019, I did meet a couple of people who went through this and they were having trouble getting a job and it, it, if this is what they're going to do, look, there, it looks like there's some good things here and it looks like there's some bad things there. Could you take this and just cut out the design thinking and, and disregard some of the design thinking and make sure you use good processes and, and user centered design? Probably. It looks like the core of this is not design thinking. It looks like there's going to be 
larger attention to user-centered design with some stuff thrown in here about design thinking because it's the flavor of the month. Bobby says, I am echoing you. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think that, so I, I would say, you know, I'd probably give this one two or three dogs out of five. I'm not really compelled by this one. I think it's got a nice low price. I think you are going to run into some crap content, but let's face it. I run into crap content everywhere. I've gone to NNG courses and they've said a few things about design thinking. And I think they feel like they have to because we all have videos and articles from Don Norman that says modern design thinking is garbage. So we know that everybody is jumping on the design thinking bandwagon, which I think is unfortunate. Um, Rodana says, I signed up for the cohort in May. My search in LinkedIn gave good results for the population of students that signed up so I can take the meat and throw the bones. Yeah, exactly. You know, we, it, it, unless sometimes we review courses on here and honestly, it looks like the entire course is garbage and there's going to be no meat on that bone. There isn't going to be marrow in that bone. That bone is dry. Um, but I think in here, there's probably some good stuff here that you can pull out and try to avoid the design thinking bid and stuff like that. Service design, I think more of us need to learn, uh, but now they're saying apply design thinking. And so that that is, is tough. Um, uh, to me, you don't need design thinking. Remember that a lot of times when people say design thinking, and here's the other problem, I don't know what they mean by design thinking. I don't know if they mean everything's a workshop. I don't know if they mean bring people together for exercises. I don't know if they mean do good research first. I don't know if they mean everybody show up to a, a meeting and guess it shit. So I genuinely don't know. And that's the problem when you see design thinking, you just don't know what they mean by it. And I don't want to give anybody the benefit of the doubt. So could you, could you take this course and just replace design thinking with the good stuff you know about user-centered design? I think so. When I look at this bulleted list, I think if you, if we took out that line, the how to apply design thinking line, and we looked at the rest of it, it looks like a solid course. It looks good to me. Stakeholder and ecosystem mapping, researching strategies, mapping journeys, uh, identifying and assessing touch points, blah, blah, blah. This looks good to me. I don't like the design thinking part because that tells me we're going to rush it. We're going to do it by committee. We're going to pin the tail on the stakeholder uh, idea, etc. Bobby says, service design is my new secret crush. Yeah, me too. You know, I came up with a, a service design blueprint idea, but I haven't been able to use it yet. I just haven't bummed into it, but I really want to. Um, so all in all, I think that I run hot and cold on this one, but I get the feeling that if you stick to some of the quality courses and you ask some good critical questions that are more about user-centered design, like if I found that my instructor would tend to say, oh, you know, if I say, hey, what are some good research strategies here? They might say, well, in design thinking, we would do boop, boop, boop. I would say, okay, but what would we do with a full user-centered design or human-centered design process if we're not doing design thinking? Your instructor should be able to answer that because they're not the same thing. So if they're telling you this is what design thinking does, they should be able to tell you this is what not design thinking does. So I would say this one looks okay. And again, I have generally positive uh, impressions of the instructors that I know. Um, I have not worked with any of them. I haven't seen their work, but I have, uh, met them and spent time with them, uh, mostly at the big D conference in 2019, where Brian brought me in to be a keynote speaker. Um, and so, um, yeah. Uh, Rodana says, yes, yes. Thank you for that perspective. Yeah. So if you signed up for the cohort and you're going through it, Rodana, you've got to, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Is it Rodana? Um, you absolutely have to get back in touch with us and let us know how it goes. I hope you're going to join the Delta CX Slack community. Uh, you can find the link to that totally free at deltacx.com slash links. I hope you'll join our community, lean on us for any support you need and tell us how it's going because I'm always looking for good programs. And look, no program is going to be a hundred percent perfect. But if this program is 85% good, 
wow, <laughs> wow, that is so much better than so much of the other garbage out there. That would be pretty cool. Um, yes, you are and I will. Good. Noor says, hey, Debbie, can I get your opinion about a UX course I took in my university last year? Depends. How much information can I get about it? And does everybody mind me running late today? Because we were supposed to have ended this stream like a half hour ago. It was so nice to sit with uh, these. Oh, here we go. Um, yeah, so, the, so the, again, the downside is safe, agile, is uh, uses lean UX and doesn't love UX. So if, uh, I forgot if she's Elisa or Alyssa, if, if she is going to be teaching the agile UX stuff, you're probably gonna be a little disappointed if she gives you safe agile's approach to UX. But again, cancel, cancel, you know, take it in, know it, do something different. Follow my, uh, follow my Delta CX, try, modified TriTrack Agile when you actually get to a job. Oh, Noor, you can't post links in YouTube because uh, YouTube will strip them out on the assumption that you're a spammer. So I'm sorry, you're not going to be able to post a link, but I would say send it in. Uh, go to deltacx.com slash links and send it in for maybe a Think Out Loud stream or actually no, if, if it's a website, send it to Think Out Loud. If it's a um, course, send it to um, uh, Critical Thinking and we'll do it next Friday. Um, there will be a show next Friday, so there you go. In fact, let's talk a little bit about the shows that are coming up. And over at deltacx.com slash links, you'll see our calendar of events. So you too can know what's coming up without me having to tell you. But Monday, of course, is Think Out Loud. We got something really fun from Steph. So we're going to be doing that on Monday. And in fact, I got something for the Monday after that. So Think Out Loud on Monday is going to be super cool. Uh, this Monday is going to be a gener fake generative research planning. And then the one after it, somebody has asked for everything. So we'll see what we can do with that. I don't think we're going to end up doing everything, but we'll talk about it. Tuesday the 5th is going to be Office Hours Ask Me Anything with super special guest Karen Lynn. Uh, check her out on LinkedIn and follow her. Thursday the 7th is our Slack monthly networking. You've got to join our Slack and check in the live events channel for how to join our uh, monthly uh, networking. We do that in AirMeet. Friday is, oh no, there is no um, critical thinking stream next Friday because I'm going to be on somebody, oh, well, actually the podcast should be ending just as we'd be going live. Yeah, it's probably going to run late. I canceled next Friday critical thinking stream. So if you send something in now, I'll see y'all in two weeks. Monday, of course, think out loud stream. Tuesday the 12th is going to be Office Hours Ask Us Anything with special guests, Dr. Nick Fine and Sophie Fryermuth, one of our favorite peeps. Um, Darren, unfortunately, is too busy, so we're going to do some three musketeersing with some special guests until uh, Darren's got time again. Um, Darren uh, is joining us, I think, in May. But uh, anyway, Wednesday, April 13th is, is going to be our first panel on... Troubles finding of your first UX job. And we've got Ralitza joining us, who just found her first UX job in November. We've got right here, Linda joining us, who I think is wor kind of working on finding her first UX job, and Elliot Mayer. So we've got panelists, and you can come and ask your questions and share your experiences live in the show. Remember, all of the shows happen at uh, 6.30 p.m. Italy time because that's where I live. And uh, so I go by my own time zone. Um, all right. So um, I hello, Elliot. I'm so happy you're here. I'm talking about you. I hope you don't mind. Um, you're going to be on the show. All right. So I'm back. And um, so uh, don't forget this. And of course, please also subscribe. And won't you please find three, four, five people you know who are into UX, maybe your coworkers, your manager, your manager's manager. Um, won't you please tell them about this channel? Because UX is, I'm uh, sorry, YouTube is murdering it in the algorithm. So I would greatly appreciate uh, word of mouth help to spread the word, as you could see from the video we looked at earlier today. My videos were not recommended alongside those. YouTube, 
etc. So like my ears were burning. Yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, oh, no, you live in Italy too. I am on the island of Sardinia. Where are you? Um, uh, so I will see everybody Monday for Think Out Loud. And if there's anything I can do for you, always uh, post to our Slack community. There's me and lots of other friendly people there always looking to help. And uh, other than that, I hope everybody will have a good and safe weekend. Please remember that COVID still exists and uh, you should take whatever precautions are appropriate for your location, your health, and your social life. So, oh, you're in Milan. Okay, you are not far. Um, but I, I can't drive there. So uh, thanks for everybody joining and chiming in on the Practicing Critical Thinking stream. Thanks to everybody who sent in these things. Uh, have a super weekend, and I'll see y'all on Monday. Customer centricity as business intelligence. Visit DeltaCX.com to learn why we are 